recording. There we go. All right. So what we'll do today is to talk about another family of instructions. And from the notes, you know, from you know, the content already in uh, Canvas, I think most of you, you know, probably can guess which, uh, what is the next instruction. It has to do with conditional jumps, okay? So hopefully you have read this you know, rather short, um, you know, basically module, okay? Because I, you know, everything that I write is quote unquote a module. So when you open it up, you know, it is really short, this one, but it is also not you know, so easy to understand unless you are going to use Logisim and then poke around and see how things work. So that's what we'll, that, this is what we'll do today is to look into jumps you know, or jump instructions, particularly conditional and unconditional jump instructions. All right, so that's what we're gonna do today. And the way I'm gonna demonstrate this is about the same as what we did in the previous two classes, um, which is to utilize Logisim and also the opto table, you know, to kind of run the instructions, execute the instructions, you know, so that we can kind of take a look at how things work in this case. So we're gonna start with the opto table because the opto table allows us to put the opcode together you know, as you know, instructions, you know, that the processor can understand. So the first one we're gonna look into is the jump instruction, which is on row 25. So jump instruction is really, oh, not this one, I take it back. It's the JMPI instruction, which is up here. So I take it back, I apologize. The jump instruction does exist, okay? It does work, but, you know, it is a cumbersome instruction to use. So these days, you know, I just use JMPI instead of you know, two you know, instructions to do the same thing. So um, where I have highlighted here, this is the row that we are focusing on first. So when we skip everything and just look at column C, column C is RTL, and you know now you know, I think uh, you guys might be a little bored by you know, me saying, do you know what RTL stands for? What is RTL? Yep, register transfer language. So it basically expresses the operation inside the processor in the form of C-like you know, syntax, where the left-hand side is a register or a you know, location in RAM, and then the right-hand side is some kind of expression also using registers. We only have so many registers in this particular processor. The software accessible registers are from A to D, okay? So register A, B, C, D inside the register bank. Those are what we call software accessible or program accessible registers, which means you know, when you specify opcode, you can designate and go like, I want to use register C for this purpose, okay? So the rest of the registers, the flags register, the instruction register, the program counter, and also the micro code pointer, those are not directly under the control of the code. You cannot specify and go like, I want to change the program counter to this. Not directly, okay? You can do it very indirectly, but not directly. The instruction register is not even accessible by any opcode at all, okay? It is completely internal to the processor. And then the microcode pointer is completely internal to the processor as well, because it is part of the controller inside the processor. All right, so when we look at the RTL of JMPI, it does not mention I at all. It simply says PC gets the D reference of PC, which means we already know it is going to read from RAM because you know, the D reference is on the right-hand side, and the address of the location that we are reading is determined by the program counter itself. Who are we going to change you know, by reading this byte from the RAM? The program counter itself. Okay, so just from reading the RTL, I know what the instruction is going to do. I just do not know how it is going to get it done, which is going to be what we're what we'll be doing today. You know, at least you know for the beginning part. All right, so to do that, I have to start Logisim. So give me a second here to start up Logisim. There we go, and then we go to the processor. Okay, so we can go to. Oops. I missed it. I missed that click. There we go. And it opened up on the other side this time. I just need to move it over to the to the side where you can see it. Give me a second. 
There we go. All right, so here's the processor. And the first thing we need to do is to specify you know, the JM, JMPI instruction. So that's what we'll do next is go to the, um, okay, where's my output table? That's not it. Is that the first one? Nope. Right there. Okay, here's my opto table. So the key to do this is to look at the opto table, and we can see that the bit pattern of the JMPI instruction does not have XX or YY. It does not use any one of the four registers inside of the register bank. It is simply just eight bits, okay? Zero, one, zero, zero is a four in hexadecimal. Zero, 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 zero is a zero in hexadecimal. In other words, the opcode itself is just four zeros, okay? Okay, that's not too hard, but it is also going to grab whatever the program counter is pointing to and put it into the program counter. By the time this RTL description happens, the program counter has already been incremented as a part of the execution cycle. In other words, you know, by the time we decode, or by the time we execute the instruction, the program counter is no longer pointing to the opcode itself, but pointing to the byte after the opcode itself. So this is how we can specify the destination. How is this jump instruction? Where are we going in this jump instruction? All right. So. If you are not sure what I mean by that, you know, we'll, you know, I'll demonstrate it. So we are now back in Logisim 4.0 for the JMPI instruction. And then the next byte, which is this byte here, is going to determine where we are going with that branch instruction or the jump instruction. It's up to you guys, okay? Where do you want me to continue execution after the JMPI instruction? Pick a number. Anything from 0, 0 to FF is okay. It can be zero, zero. But zero, zero is not a whole lot of fun, so let's go to some location that is, I know, let's try FF, okay? We just go all the way to the end of the RAM component and see what happens, okay? So I'm gonna put FF over here, all right? So now we are ready to execute the jump instruction. This is the only instruction in the entire program. Well, technically that is not true because everywhere you see zero, zero, those are all instructions. They're just no op instructions, which means you know, they don't do a single thing to the four registers in the register bank. They don't do anything about the flag register. All they do is to increment the program counter. All right, so what we'll do is now we're gonna go down here and then we'll you know, go to the execute phase of this instruction and then just you know, pause over there just so that we can understand how the instruction gets the job done. All right, so we have your fetch, and then we have increment of the micro core pointer, then we have the increment of the program counter itself, which is actually very important in this case, because we, if we did not increment the program counter, then we would not be grabbing the uh, byte that contains the location that we need to jump to. So with control T, you can see how the program counter is now incremented to one, and then the next uh, falling edge is going to be the decode cycle. So now we have decode. Decode basically means you just copy the instruction register content to the most significant A bit of the micro code pointer and then pad the least significant four uh, bits with a zero, with four zeros. All right, so now we need to pause because you know, when we see that we are at the location of four zero zero, that means we are about to actually execute the JMPI instruction. So we're going to go back to you know, the usual thing, okay? We have a systematic way of looking at what registers are going to get changed. None of the four registers in the, in the register bank is going to change because the input enable of the entire register bank is a zero. Okay, so we can skip that one. We know nothing is going to happen to any one of the four registers. RAM is addressed, okay? RAM is uh, specified to be enabled because the selection is a one. We know we are reading because LD or load is a one, okay? So we can start with this, okay? Because as soon as you see that RAM is addressed, we should probably answer a few questions. Now that we also know that it's reading, there the two, the, the two additional questions should be fairly specific at this point. So what two questions should we ask?
Hmm? Sorry? What? Okay, there are two what's. <laughs> there are two what's in this case. Because we have the A port, which is one what, and then we have the B port, which is the other what. So how, how, what, how are these two what's different? One is asking what is telling us where to read. The other one is asking what is updated because we are reading. Okay, so there are two questions that we need to ask. One is who is telling us which location we are reading? The second one is, okay, we are reading from that location in RAM, but who is getting updated because of the read operation? All right, so those are two important questions to ask as soon as we know that we are reading from that. So we address one question at a time. There's no, there's no particular uh, order of how to address those questions, but since you know, we like to go for, you know, go for alphabetical order, so we'll ask about you know, who is specifying the A port first. So you track this one, okay, back to the multiplexer here. This multiplexer has a select of one, which means input one connects to the output. So we track down input one, and input one just goes, com it comes out of the program counter. So right at this point, we know that the program counter itself is telling us which location to read in RAM, okay? So if I was doing this, you know, and not, and not have a, the familiar, familiarity of the processor, I'll be you know, jotting down some notes. And I have no idea where my notepad is located because it's supposed to be somewhere on this screen. I think it, oh, I know, I know what's happening. It just put it into a wrong screen, you know, right here. I'm gonna have to put, you know, move it back to the other screen. So it seems like previous section, da, da, da. nope, we don't, we don't want to restore. And then move this one to the other screen. I forgot to put everything into the correct screen. Um, OBS is still recording fine, so you know, I think we are good in terms of the recording. All right, so I'm just gonna jot down some notes here. RAM.A is specified by you know, the Q port of PC. In other words, we are now saying, okay, we are reading from RAM, and the location that, reading, that we are reading from is you know, controlled by the program counter. So this expression in C++ is telling us you know, what we know up to this point. Uh, we also know that this is the right-hand side of an assignment because we are reading, not writing. So that means you know, I just have to figure out um, the content that I'm reading from that location, who's getting it, okay? Now, one thing that is also important to note is the location I'm reading is no longer the address of the opcode itself. That has to do with the second rising edge you know, after you know, the microcontroller pointer starts with zero, 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 that increments the, pro the program counter. So the program counter has already been auto-incremented to the next location, the location right next to the address of the opcode, which is in this case, the JMPI instruction. All right, so the next question is, who is being changed because we are reading from this location? To answer that question, we have to track down the D port of RAM. It goes to a whole bunch of places, okay? The, reg the instruction register is not enabled, so it's not, gonna, it's not getting updated. This particular multiplexer is uh, having the input one selected, so we probably should track it down a little bit here. So the output here is going into another multiplexer, which also has input one selected, and this is input one. So once we have tracked down everything, now we know that the program counter itself is going to be updated because of the uh, because we are reading from RAM. So whatever the D port of RAM is outputting, the PC dot D port is receiving it. So if I were to document this, I would then have said, okay, uh, PC dot D, which is an input port is RAM.D, which is an output port in this case. So that means I have just answered my own question. The program counter is now updated to whatever the program counter itself is pointing to. I'm gonna pause here, okay, and see if there are any questions about how this works. In terms of the pathway inside the processor, 
This is actually one of the simplest instructions. Okay, we are using the program counter to specify the address of the RAM. We are reading from RAM. Okay, the content that we are reading is going back to update the program counter itself. It does not involve the ALU. It does not involve the register bank. It is just the program counter and the RAM doing everything here. Okay. But what is the effect of this whole thing? Okay, so let, let's go back to the uh, simulator. And we already know what's going to happen because we know the input to the program counter is FF. We know the program counter is enabled. The PCEN is directly controlled by the ROM component. So we don't have to ask the question of why is it up getting updated? Well, because the ROM component says we should do that. So that means you know when we have a rising edge, when the clock goes from low to high, the program counter will change to FF, okay, which is the last location of RAM. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Control T. The program counter is now FF. The program counter is also known as, depending on the architecture, it is also known as the instruction pointer. So if you're using the Intel architecture, then the program counter in this class is known as the instruction pointer or the IP for good reason. It points to where we are supposed to fetch the next instruction or, or opcode. So that's exactly what the program is going to do. So when we go back, so after we execute, we have a falling edge, and this falling edge is going to reset the microcode pointer back to zero, zero, zero. Okay, so we'll observe that. Control T, you can see how the program, the microcode pointer is now back to zero, 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 and we are about to have a rising edge, which means we're back to the fetch phase of executing an instruction. But where are we fetching the opcode from this time? You can barely see it, okay, but I'll, I'll make sure that we can see that. So we are in a fetch operation. Where are we fetching this opcode? Location FF. Okay, exactly. And you can see that too, you know, from the RAM component, you can also see that location FF is now highlighted because you know, we are about to read from that location and then we'll put this zero, zero into the instruction register because we are executing this opcode which is at the very end of the RAM, which is okay, okay? You know, well, after we execute this opcode, what's gonna happen? It goes all the way back to location zero, zero. So in a sense, this program is a tight loop. It is not as tight as possible. Nonetheless, it is a tight loop. It just kind of alternates from the fetch perspective. It just alternates between location zero, zero and FF. All right, so do we have any questions about this unconditional brand? In other words, every single time we you know, execute a JMPI instruction, execution will continue to whatever location you specify as the second byte of the instruction. So do we have any questions about this? Nope, okay, all right. So this is you know, it's just you know, me setting up you know, to talk about the actual instruction that I want to talk about here, okay, which is a conditional branch. So before we look at how it gets the job done, so let me just go ahead and reset the simulation first because we are done with the demonstration of this instruction already. So now we are going to go back to the opcode table, okay, because we need to take a look at the, where's my, oh, there we go. So we want to take a look at a JCI instruction, this particular one. So when you look at the RTL description, it goes like, hmm, that looks a little more complicated than the previous one. It is using a ternary expression, which means that the question mark and the colon separate the three parts of a ternary expression. So do we need a quick review of what a ternary expression does? Nope, we're good with that. Okay, excellent. So whatever is to the left of the question mark is a condition. So we are looking at the C flag, which is bit zero of the flag's register as a condition because it can be zero or non-zero. Is that okay? All right, so the C over here is referring to bit zero of the flag's register. So we're using it as a condition. 
if the C flag is non-zero, which means row at one, because it can only be zero or one in this case, then we are doing the same thing as a JMPI instruction. We are simply using whatever the program whatever the program counter is pointing to in RAM to update the program counter. So that means you know if the C flag is a one, we have basically a de facto JMPI instruction. What if the C flag is a zero? Well, in that case, we're just going to increment the program counter and continue execution with whatever opcode is after the JCI instruction. Is that okay? All right. So this is how we make decision making in the processor. All the fancy, you know, all the fancy uh, conditions that you specify in C++, everything has to boil down to one of these five conditional branch instructions. How are they different? Well, simple. The way they're different is simply which bit do we look at in the flags register? C is the is bit zero, Z is bit one, S is bit two, O is bit three, and then L is bit four. So that's basically how we make the most basic decision when we are, when we are specifying code in assembly language. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. All right. So we're going to write a short program in this case, okay? And I'm going to have to do the control T a bunch of times before we get to the instruction that we want to get to. So based on what we have talked about already, um, let's see. Okay, that's reset. That's good. So I'm going back to the assembler and go to the source tab to write this code. And I want to pretend that I'm doing a subtraction, okay? So LDI, okay? LDI basically initializes a register with a particular value, with a constant. So we can say, let's say register B started with a value of three, and register C starts with a value of five, and then we perform a subtraction, okay? So we're gonna subtract um, C from B, okay? So the result should be negative, and also have the carry flag being set, okay? Because the carry flag is also the borrow flag after a subtraction. And then after that, we have a JCI instruction, which basically says if the carry flag or the borrow flag is set, then we go to a particular location. And I'll put a label here, which is L1, okay? If not, we're gonna, you know, we are gonna stop here. So L1 is not defined, okay? If I just let the assembler do its thing, it will give me an error of you know, saying unresolved reference L1. That's exactly what it is supposed to be because I have not defined the label L1 yet. The definition of a label is the name of the label followed by a colon. Okay, so that's how we define a label. So we define another label here and put another halt instruction here. So this program has two halt instructions. I need to know which one I'm gonna be stopping at. So according to what we already know about these instructions, which one do you think we're gonna stop at? Are we gonna stop at the one on line five, or are we going to stop at the one on line seven? seven. The one on line seven? Yes, that is correct, because the JCI will jump, because you know, subtracting five from three will end up with a borrow. In other words, K8, not K8, sorry, T8 is gonna be a one after the subtraction. All right, so we're gonna give it a try, okay? So now we go to the RAM file in order to download the program. So this part is something that you probably know already, you know, because our previous two labs involved, you know, having to download the program that I wrote in the uh, lab itself. So I'm gonna call this one JCI, okay? You know, just simple you know, name of the code here. So now I switch back to Logisim. Okay, this time I'm not gonna handwrite the code here because it's a little bit longer and more complicated. So do a right click, go to load image, specify the name, okay, it is in my temp folder. It is called jci.csv, and now the program is in here. It's, there's a lot of stuff that I need to do to get to this location, okay? So I'm just going to kind of fast forward everything by control T until this you know, location is highlighted. The reason why I know it is this particular byte is because if I go back to the assembly, uh, not assembly, but the opcode table, JCI is 4-4. That's the opcode of JCI. 
The other way to confirm this is to go to the Assemble tab, because the Assemble tab will show you the actual code on in column A, but then it also tells you what byte you know, that particular mnemonic translates to. So now we can see that you know, the JCI L1 instruction translates to a 44, which is the opcode of JCI. It is also the second byte is 08, because 08 is the location of the halt instruction right after L1. Yes? JCI stands for jump if and only if the carry flag is a one. Or in short. Oh, okay. Yep. And IFF is important because IFF stands for if and only if, which is different from if. It's also different from only if because it is the combination of both if and only if. That's why it's called if and only if. Okay. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> the, the shortest way to understand you know, what is if and only if is if I jump, it means that the carry flag is a one. If the carry flag is a one, I'm jumping. If I am not jumping, it means the carry flag is a zero. If the carry flag is zero, it means I'm not jumping. Okay, so it means those four things. Okay, not any two or three of the four. It has to be those four things, okay? All right, so now we switch back to Logisim, and then I'm just gonna do Control T in a sequence until you know, the, you know, the four four is highlighted. So, dun, 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 dun. okay, now we have to be slow like that. Okay, so now we are about to fetch this location. I believe the micro code pointer. Well, I take it back. This is you know, just after the increment of the program counter, so we are not quite ready to fetch it yet. Okay. In other words, how we how do we know which uh, step of instruction execution are we in? It is the microcode pointer. So we are about to fetch. Okay. So I correct myself. We are about to fetch, and the location we are fetching from is determined by the program counter, and it is at location zero five. And the instruction at location 0, 5, it, there, there are two ways to look at this. You can look at the RAM component. This is location 0, 4. This is location 0, 5. So we are about to fetch the JCI instruction. The fetching part is not going to be, I'm not going to go over fetch and increment of the program counter and all that stuff in detail anymore because we have been doing that for a long time already. So instead, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so we are stopping right now. This is right after decode. So the reason why I'm right after decode is because the microcode pointer just changed to basically the opcode plus an extra zero on the right-hand side. That is how I know I just decoded. Okay, so right after decode is execute. There are a few things I need to double check first. First of all, I want to know whether register D that's negative two. Because remember, we subtracted five from three. Register B had a value of three. Register C has a value of five. Three minus five is negative two. So now we first examine in the register bank and see if register B has a value of negative two. Well, you don't have to go that far. You can actually see the content of register B right here. It is one, 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 zero. Is that negative two? How do we know whether that is negative two or not? So this is, go ahead. You can use two's complement, yes. So two's complement does the same thing as um, arithmetic negation. So if you perform two's complement on 1111, 1110, then you will get the, uh, the value of the opposite sign to whatever it is right now, and you'll get two. So that means 1111, 1110 is in fact the representation of negative two. You can also apply the VS function, okay? So if you apply the VS function, you'll be adding two, four, six, eight, uh, 16, 32, 64, and then you subtract 128 from that sum. That will turn out to be two as negative two as well. Okay, so you have to remember the VS function, okay? If you're looking at me and ask, what is the VS function? It means you need to jot down your more notes 
okay? Put all the definitions to one place so it's easier for you to find those definitions. I can even tell you where you can find the definition of VS. There are two places. The first time we talk about that is um, signed versus unsigned. That module has the definition of VU and VS. And then the second time we talked about this is when we talked about binary comparison. So both of those modules will have the definition of VS as well as VU. Okay, so that's one. And we also want to know whether you know, bit, uh, the carry flag is a one or not. So that way, you know, with that one, we have to look at the flags register. So when you look at one five as a hexadecimal number, do you think bit zero is a one? It's one five, okay? So that means we have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one. So the least significant bit is indeed a one. So that means the carry flag is a one in this case, which makes sense because when you subtract five from three from the unsigned perspective, we end up with a borrow because five is greater than three, so we end up with a borrow. But the borrow flag is also reflected as the carry flag and that's why the carry flag is a one in this case. Are we okay so far? Okay, so I have everything already set up here. So now the question is, how does the conditional branch know which way to go? So now we examine all the things, okay? We look at the register bank, nothing in the register bank is getting updated. Okay, that's kind of cool. And then we look at the, uh, the flags register. The flags register is used in this case, but it is not updated. Okay, so right now we just go like, ah, we'll skip the flags register for now. And then we look at RAM. RAM is being selected, it is enabled. In fact, we are reading from RAM. So now we ask those two natural questions again. Who is determining which location to read from RAM and who is who might end up getting updated by reading the RAM? Is that okay? So those are the two questions to ask. So we answer the first question first. Who is controlling which location to read from? So we track down the A port, which is coming out of this multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of one, which means input one connects to the output. Input one is the output of the program counter itself. So that's why we know that the program counter is determining which location we are reading from RAM. Is that okay? So from this perspective, it is the same as uh, the JMPI instruction that we demonstrated just a little bit earlier. The second question is a little bit trickier this time because we want to determine who is getting updated because of the D port over here. So when you look at the D port, you go like, okay, you know, it, we do the same analysis. It's going into this multiplexer, but this multiplexer is disabled, so it's not going to do anything at all. But this multiplexer here is, does not have an enable, which means it's always enabled. The select is a one, which means input one, which is highlighted right now, connects to the output. When you look at this multiplexer, once again, we have a select of one, and so we know that the program counter is getting updated by the location that reading, we are reading from RAM, just like the JMPI instruction. <coughs> so go like, wait, hold on a second here. That doesn't seem like conditional to me, okay? In other words, I have not explained why this multiplexer, okay, let me point to the multiplexer. I have not explained why this multiplexer is selecting input one instead of input zero, okay? So the other thing we can do now is I can go to the flags register and just say, you know what? I'm gonna turn the bit zero of the flags register from a one to a zero, just to see what happens, okay? Now obviously you cannot do this with an actual processor that is on in a computer, okay? Because I'm doing operations only possible in a simulator. But I wanna see the effect. So now I'm gonna go like, okay, let's change this to one four. One four versus one five has only one bit of difference. It is bit zero, okay? In other words, the only thing I have done so far with the flags register is I'm keeping all the other bits exactly the same as before, but bit zero is going from a one back to a zero, okay? But you can see the effect already, okay? You know, I know most of you are not focusing on that part, but when you look at the NA, when you look at the multiplexer, the select of the multiplexer that is feeding to the D port of the program counter, 
It's not a one anymore. This time it is a zero. That is how decisions are made. Because when the when PC mux mux is a zero, then we are using input zero instead of input one to update the program counter. When you look at input zero, it is simply the program counter plus one. It's coming out of the adder that adds one to the current value of the program counter. So that seems kind of magical, but there's no, nothing magical about this. Everything is only a logic in a processor. So now the question is, how does PC Mux know that we just changed bit zero of the flags register? So that becomes the next question. Does that make sense? Okay, you know, because of the experiment that, we, that I just did. So now we have to look into PC Mux. It's like, who makes you know, PC Mux? Well, as it turns out, there's no PC Mux coming out of the ROM itself. We have PC Mux Mux, but we don't have PC Mux. So when you look up the entire diagram, PC Mux is here. Okay? In other words, PC Mux does not come out of the ROM, which also means we might want to explain why PC Mux is a zero, because there's some kind of logic to tell us that PC Mux should be a zero in this case. It is coming out of a multiplexer, so when we know that there's a zero coming out of a multiplexer, what is the next natural question to ask? What, how does, what does a multiplexer do? That is correct, okay? The best way to describe it is it selects one of the inputs to connect to the output, okay? So what you said is correct, but I'm just kind of add, I'm adding a little bit more detail to it. It selects one and only one of the input and connect it to the output. We know the output is a zero, so the question is which input did it choose? Oh, there's a whole bunch of choices here. If I need a zero, I can choose input zero, input one, input two, three, input five, and input six. I don't know which one they have chosen. How do I find out which one it is choosing? The select, okay? The thing that is right under the gray dot is the selection. It tells us which input is being selected. So when I click on it, it is saying, oh, let's go ahead and select input zero. It, this is input zero. Where is that coming from? It's coming from a splitter. The splitter in the end connects to the output of the flags register. So that is the logic of the processor using bit zero of the flags register in order to control how we are going to update the program counter over here. In other words, what we just saw a little bit earlier ultimately connects to this particular node, which allows us to select, if it is false, we go here. If it is true, we go here. That is the ternary, quote unquote, ternary expression in circuit. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. Yes, go ahead. Is there any way we can describe that number and what is the other way that we can find it? Um, what do you mean by resetting the time? Turning everything to zero? Yeah, the on the time. Okay, so, so let's find out whether we can turn everything to zero. So what you're asking for is an operation that can turn the carry flag, the Z flag, the uh, sign flag, uh, the overflow flag, the L flag, and I think I forgot one, the Z flag itself all to zero. Okay, so let, let's try to figure out whether we can actually do that at runtime instead of saying, oh, okay, in the simulator, we just reset everything to zero. Okay, so we'll try to, we're, this is a digression, but we want to say, what makes the C flag zero, the Z flag is a zero, the O flag, oh, the S flag being a zero, the O flag being a zero, and then the L flag being a zero. That's what we're asking, right? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll do the easy part first, okay? These three are easy, or I should say this one is easy, because if the sign flag is already a zero, and the over flag is also a zero, the exclusive all between those two objects must be a zero. The sign flag is the most sophisticated of the results, Okay, which is you know, what, we, what we used to call D7 or you know, D underscore, um, I mean, subscript M minus one, the most significant bit of the result. So you know, L being zero is easy, okay? You know, get, that can be explained by 
your what your these two being zeros. So now we want to address these one by one. Okay, how do you make z being zero? Okay, the result is non-zero. We just have to perform an operation where the end result is not zero. Okay, that's that doesn't sound too hard. Okay, this one says the result sign bit or most significant bit is non-zero. In other words, it has to be a non-negative value. Okay, uh, that still doesn't sound too hard. This one says you know, we do not end up with a, uh, either a carry in an addition or we do not end up with a borrow in a subtraction. So no carry or borrow, okay? Nor, I should say. Nor, and no hyphen over here. Okay, there we go. So these are the constraints, okay? We have to perform some kind of operation that ends up with no carry, no borrow. The result is non-zero, and the sign bit of the result is also non-zero, which means the result is non-negative. All right, so I'll let you guys think about, there are at least two ways to do this, okay? You can either use an add operation or subtract operation to do it. So let's go for subtraction, okay? Tell me one, one particular subtraction that can end up with all of these constraints being met. Zero minus zero would not work because zero minus zero is a zero, which means the z bracket will become a one. But you're so close, okay? Instead of zero minus zero, no, that would also be a zero. <laughs> one minus zero, yes, okay. So one minus zero would end would do this. So that means LDI A with one, LDI B with zero. Do a subtraction of B from A that will reset all the flags. But that's not the only one, because we can also do an addition, right? So the addition part is just easy. Turn that into an add, it would do the same thing. Because in this case, we still end up with no carry nor borrow. The result is still non-zero because it's a one. And um, the result is non-negative either because it's, because it's just one. So does that answer your question? I like that, that's kind of like a little puzzle, you know. These are the things that computer science people or developers, you know, coder, software engineers, computer engineers, anyone in that particular field basically need to solve, okay? Is you have some constraints, there's a certain you know, target, a certain objective you want to accomplish specified in some kind of logic here. And then you have to figure out how do I get that, okay? Well, sometimes it's not even possible. So in, in the case that it is not possible, you have to basically logically explain why it is not possible. But in this case, it is definitely possible. All right, so are we good so far? All right, so when you are writing code using conditional branches and loops and stuff like that, if you are to just do a control T all the time to keep track of things, it's, it can be very difficult to debug a program. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you a very basic tool, which is something that you will use, you'll be using only for about a week or two, but it gives you a general idea of how do I know what my program is doing, okay? Where it has been to, you know, and you know, what are the values of the registers and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm gonna write a program, okay? We have enough um, content at this point to start to write you know, simple loops, okay? But I'm not gonna depend, you guys don't have to do it, okay? So I'm gonna write some loops here, and let me see, let me just get my command line tool you know, up here. All right, so I'm gonna write a very simple program. Um, yeah, we just call it loop. I'm just thinking about the name of the, you know, the program. So we'll start with um, LDI, okay, LDI with, um, I have to choose a register, you know, C for counter, okay, sounds, sounds cool. So I'm going to put a 4 into the register C. So one thing you might want to do when we start to write code is you want to comment what it does, okay. This one is simply putting a value of 4 into the register C, and then they put a label here, L1. And L1 is going to um, 
okay. I have to choose one to the instructions that we have already talked about. So we are going to LDI field B with one. And this one I can also put up here. So the register B is always just one. B is always one. It's a constant. And then at L1, I am going to do a compare or a subtraction. Okay, let's do a subtraction instead. So we say subtract B from C. Okay, so the um, equivalent RTL description is C minus uh, equal to B. Or if you prefer the other way to say this, it is C equals to C minus B. So this one, this one is called a compound assignment Okay, in C++. Uh, this one is just a straight up your know, regular you know, assignment statement or expression, whichever one you use is fine. Okay, there's no real difference between these two. Um, this one is slightly more cryptic. This one can be understood by anyone. And then I do a JCI. Uh, okay, remember your JCI to label L2. Okay, if um, register B if, if register C is less than register B, then I'm branching, okay? And then otherwise, I'm gonna do, un, I will do an unconditional branch back to L1, and then here's label L2, and then the halt instruction, because that's the end of the program, okay? So this one basically is saying, you know, if C is less than B before, after, okay, after the subtraction, go to label L2, and then this one is basically saying if C is greater than or equal to B after the subtraction, then go to L1. Okay, so we have a kind of a, a really basic loop over here. Um, so how many times are we gonna go through the loop? The first time C has a value of four, then three, then two, then one. So one minus one is a zero. It's not gonna trip the borrow flag or the carry flag just yet, okay? So we have one more iteration when C finally decrements from zero to negative one, then it will trip the carry flag, okay? So we are expecting by the time we get to the halt instruction here, the register C would have a value of, I'm sorry, go ahead negative one, which is FF in hexadecimal. We are expecting the carry flag itself to be set because otherwise we will not be branching out. So those are the things that we kind of expect, okay? So how do we debug this program or how do we know how this program gets the job done? So now we go, uh, okay, this is how I need to do things because I'm not using a GUI uh, editor. The reason why I use my own editor here because it has syntax highlighting. I'm the kind of person who makes you know, all kinds of simple errors. So if I have a typo here, it will highlight the entire line and go like, hey, this does not make sense, Tech, you fix it. Now it doesn't quite know how to fix it, but at least it will highlight and tell me that something is not right, okay? So this is using, this is VI, you know, the editor itself is called VI, which, which stands for visual, okay? VI is the first two letters of visual. I'm not gonna bore you guys with the details of you know, why VI is my choice of editor and why you know, it is really cool, but you know, we're just gonna, I, I would use it. You don't have to use it. The learning curve to use VI is steep, okay? So unless you have a lot of time on your hand and you are just curious about you know, what this is all about, you don't have to learn it, okay? So now we have the, everything in the clipboard and I can now go back to my assembler right here. There we go. Go back to the source tab, erase everything in column A, and then just paste my new program in here and wait a little bit because if there is an error, you know, column B will report the error. There's no error here. So then I go to the RAM file, go to file, download, and go to a CSV and then name this um, loop.csv, okay, there we go. And then now we switch back to logisim because I actually want to run the code. So let's go to logisim, which is right here. Go to the RAM component, okay. The first thing I would do is do a control R. You can either go to simulate and then click reset simulation 
or you can type control R on the keyboard as a shortcut. So now we got everything reset. RAM is now all back to all zeros. Right click, load image, go to the RAM file, which is called loop.csv. I'm already in the temp folder. There we go. So we got the program in. So one thing that you have done up to this point is to run the program at full speed, right? So we can go ex do exactly that, okay? Make sure your tick frequency is all the way up, and then you just do a control K, or you'll select your tech ticks enabled, and now we are all done because the halt pin is a one. So I can now stop the whole thing, control K again, and then I can go back to the flags register and see if the flags register has at least bit zero being a one. And it is one five, which means bit zero is indeed a one. Okay, kind of cool. And then we can go back to the um, register band. Register B should continue to have a value of one because I, once I did the LDI you know, B with one, I never did anything else with register B. So it should continue to have a value of one. <coughs> register C, on the other hand, should now be negative one because you know, until it gets to negative one, I should never end up with a borrow. So now we right click, go to view register bank, and we can see register B is indeed a one, register C is indeed a you know, FF, which is negative one. So the program seemed to do what I think it should do. Okay, But exactly what path did it take to execute this program? It's kind of like, mm, I don't know exactly. Okay, So the next time I run this code, okay, I'm going to run the code again. But this time when I run the code, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm not doing a control R anymore. So to do this trick, you have to make sure the clock is low. Okay, that's the first thing you need to check is to make sure the clock is low. If it is high, click again, make it low. And then the second thing you do is to click this button here. This button connects to the tunnel called the reset, which goes to everything that is resettable except for RAM. Okay, so the RAM component is the only thing not connected to this particular reset tunnel. The reason why I made this is because I don't, I'm too lazy to have to reload the, the content into RAM. So I'm resetting the entire program back to the original state, but I don't have to reload you know, the content of the RAM. Okay? So now I go to simulate again. There are a few things that it's, one thing here is particularly interesting. It's called logging. So once you get into logging, it can first let you select what do you want to log. In other words, all of these things are fair things that you can log, okay? You can log, <clears throat> uh, this A is referring to the output pin A, which is you know, just reflecting the A port of RAM. This is the port of RAM. This is uh, the flags register um, as a output pin. This is the flags register as its content, which basically are the same. So these two are basically the same thing, um, and so on and so forth, okay? Of all of these things, the program counter is one of the most important things to track. Because the program counter, if you track the program counter, it will tell you how your program executes, what instructions it will execute. Now, it doesn't quite tell you the opcode of the instructions, but it will tell you the address of those instructions. So the program counter is an important thing to track. So I'm gonna click you know, the program counter, okay, or just you know, add here. And once you add, it is by default tracking in base two, unless you're very good at reading binary number and you're converting it in your head to hexadecimal, I'm gonna change the radix, okay, which is basically just the, the base of the number, so I can change it to base 16, okay? Base 16 works best because the assembler also uses base 16, okay? So that's why it is one of the better ones to use. And I will also go to opfetch, okay, which is basically saying every time I'm, in, I'm fetching something, this turns into a one, okay? So that is also important to me. This one can stay as a base two number because opfetch is either a one or a zero, okay? So having, being, a two, uh, being a binary number is okay in this case. So once you specify what you want to log, the next thing is how do you want to log it, okay? There are two ways to do it. One way is to simply use a table here, and it will basically show you a table when the program executes. <coughs> Let me show you what it looks like.
presentation, you can close the table as soon as you specify what you want to log. You can close this window because your logic stream will already understand, oh, okay, I'm supposed to log the PC, the program counter, and also opfetch. If you're ever curious about what opfetch is, opfetch is, uh, where's the pin? It's, it's right here. So opfetch is this particular pin. Um, it is the result of the end between the enable of the instruction register and the clock being a one. In other words, opfetch is a one if and only if I was just, I just finished a fetch operation. Okay, so it is of importance here. So now we can run the code, okay? Control K, running the code, making sure that my halt pin is getting, becoming a zero, becoming a one, halt has to become a one. Control K again, I'm now done, you know, executing the entire program. So now I go back to simulate, go back to logging, and you can now see that, oh, okay, there's a bunch of stuff that I logged. So in this case, um, you have to ignore everything that has a PC and also the op fetch being a zero, because an op fetch is a zero, I'm not fetching yet, okay? I'm not, it's not signifying that, oh, I just grabbed the instruction from that location. In other words, only pay attention to the rows when op fetch is a one. So this means you know, the first instruction I execute is from location zero, zero. The second instruction that I execute is from location zero, two. Wait, hold on a second, Tech. I know how to count. Zero does not go to two, it goes to one. What happened to location zero one? You can see that location zero one is actually in the PC, but it was not fetched. Why not? To answer that question, we go to the assemble tab of the assembler. Where is location zero one? What role does it play in this particular program? Column W is the address of the byte corresponding to column X. Column X is the actual opcode of an instruction. So when you look at the LDI C4 instruction, it has two bytes. What, what is the purpose of the second byte in an LDI instruction? It is the immediate value, okay? That's the constant that you want to put into the register specified by the opcode. So that means the second byte of LDI is not an opcode. We are not supposed to fetch it. This is also why the LDI instruction auto increments the program counter when it grabs the content pointed to by the program counter, okay? So that's, so this explains why the program counter in terms of fetch operation went from zero, zero to zero, two, because zero, one, location zero, one is not an opcode. The processor did the right thing of not fetching from that location. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Okay. So that means, you know, when you look at this diagram or when you look at this table here, you only have to focus on the rows where up fetch is the one because those are the actual fetch operations. So this will give you an idea of, oh, why is this a loop? It's called a loop because we went from location 07 back to location 04. Only a loop will basically execute you know, down and then, oh, by the way, we have to go back like that. So this is a loop. How did we get to the halt instruction? Okay, so now the next question is how did we get to the halt instruction? So to answer that question, you go back to the assemble tab. Okay, the assemble tab is actually awfully useful because we know the halt instruction is at location 09. So now we go back to the trace itself and go like, okay, it should be all the way to the bottom. Okay, right, because this is the fetch of the halt instruction. What is right before that? Right before that, is the instruction starting at location zero 05. What is the location starting at location, what is the instruction starting at location zero 05? Go back to the assemble tab. Location zero 05 is right here. That's our JCL instruction. We did a conditional branch and we ended up at the location of the halt instruction. Okay, so you go like, so wait, 
if it is a JMPI instruction, that would end up you know, at the location of uh, zero 09 as well. That is true, okay? So that means we want to see the JCI instruction not branching to location zero 09 in, because you know, the carry flag is a zero. So we can now go back to the trace here, and then we go back to some earlier version of location 05, like this one over here. This is location 05, which is our JCI instruction. We are fetching, which means we are about to execute. But this time, it ended up at location 07 instead, which means it did not make the branch to location 09. So this is showing you graphically, well, not so graphically, but it is showing you that the conditional branch does not always branch to location 09. Most of the time, it does not even branch. It just goes to whatever instruction is following the JCI instruction. Because when you go to the assemble tab, the instruction, uh, the JCI instruction starts at location 05. Location 07 is not special at all. It is simply the address of the instruction right next to or following immediately the JCI instruction. So when the JCI instruction does not branch, all it does is to go like, oh, forget it. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. Just follow, just continue execution whatever, with whatever instruction is following the JCI instruction. Is that okay? All right. So you can make this fancy, okay, you know, and try to log even more things, which makes it a little busy and a little more difficult to read. Okay, so we can do that. So let me go back to Logisim, um, and this time, you know, we are going to go like, oh, I want to see register C decrementing, okay? You can do that, okay? You can either log reg C, which is an output pin, or you can log you know, re uh, register C as one of the registers inside the register bank, because you, if you want to do that, you have to double click on register bank, um, and then you click, you know, register C over here, okay, which is a lot more work than you have to do than just doing this. So I'm going to do this, okay, add it here, and we can log this one in, okay, base 16 and base 10 makes no difference in this case because the value is so low, so we can change it to base 10, okay, and base 16 then, great. Okay, so this time I want to log into a file, okay? Logging into a table is easy, okay? But then you, you can only kind of scroll through that whole thing, you know, it is kind of troublesome. So this time I want to log it to a file it's just a regular file, okay? Well, not so regular, but it's a text file you can open with Notepad or just about any editor. So now I go to File, and you don't, there's no way to click this, okay? It's all grayed out. So the way to enable it is to specify the name of the file that will contain the logs. So now I go here and go like, okay, this is loop.tsv, okay? This is the reason why I do not name the RAM file loop.tsv because path separator value is, I want to reserve that extension for logging, okay? So TSV is for logging. As once I specify that, now I have this button here to disable. Now, if, because the, if the button says to disable, what is the current state of logging to a file? It's enabled, okay? Because otherwise the label, the, the label of the button would not be to disable. It is already enabled currently. All right, so if that is the case, um, including the header line, eh, kind of useful, because otherwise I cannot tell which column is which column. So now it's a closed window, and I have to reset everything. So let's check out the clock is high this time. Make sure the clock is low to begin with, okay, before you click this button. So now I just reset everything. The RAM component is intact, because you know, the RAM component does not connect to that reset you know, line. So now I can run the whole program again, control K, run the whole thing, and I'm pretty sure it's done already, but I'm gonna double check and make sure that the halt pin is a one. Control K again to stop the execution of the program. So this time, the output is in a file, okay? So let me show you what, you know, what is the content of that file. Uh, first of all, let's make sure it does exist. So loop.tsv is in, in fact here. There are two ways to open this file. You can use a regular text editor like Notepad in Windows. It will open it just fine. But the other way to open this is to use Excel or a spreadsheet program because it's a TSV file. So when you open it with a spreadsheet program, it will tabulate 
into columns and visually it is a lot easier to read. Okay, I don't have Excel here, but I do have LibreOffice. So I'm gonna use uh, LibreOffice um, lib.tsv, tsv.tsv, there we go. It automatically recognizes it is tab separator already. I just click okay. So now, you know, this is my spreadsheet. Let me um, zoom in a little bit so that you guys can see you know, what it has logged so far. So now you can see how register C, which is column C coincidentally, is you know, changing from initialized to four when we execute the instruction on line one. In other words, all of these reflects you know, operation in one single instruction execution because we have a fetch here. The next fetch is over here. So everything in between belongs to the operation of one single instruction. The first instruction that we have somehow ended up putting a value of four into register C. Is that what you expect? Okay, if you don't remember the program, let's go back to the program first. So when we go back to the program, go to the source tab, which is a lot easier to read, that's exactly what it was intending to do. Is that okay? So when you look at the spreadsheet, okay, you can just kind of scroll down and go like, oh, okay, it decorates to three. Who is responsible to change it to three? The change is right here, okay? But when you look at the fetch operation leading to register C becoming a three, it started here, okay? Which also means the program counter or the address of the instruction that is responsible for changing the value of register C from four to three is at location four, okay? Do you remember what is at location four? Or do you know, do, do you have a suspicion of, of what is at location four that is capable of changing register C from a four to a three? Oh, let's, let's, let's take a look, okay? So we go to the assemble tab because now we know the address. At location four, it is our subtract instruction. Does that surprise you? Nope. That's exactly what we expect you to do. So you can add more things to log if you want to. So if you're curious about, I want to know what is in the flags register after every single subtraction, you add the flags register to the things that you want to log. But there's one more thing that is important. You might want to write this down because you're gonna need that for the lab. <clears throat> As you continue to log the program, okay, if you do the same thing again, okay, so let's say, you know, I do, you know, the same thing and um, reset, you know, the processor, make sure the clock is low and then just click the reset button and I run the whole thing again. This run is going to append to the log file. In other words, it does not clean up the log file and start from the beginning. It will just append to what is already in the log file. That may not be what you want to do, okay? Because if you want to debug a program, this will just cause confusion, okay? So if you want to reset the log file, there are two ways to do it. One way to do it is kind of the, clum the clumsy way to do it. If it's going into the operating system using a file manager and delete that file, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it from inside Logisim is to go to simulate, go to logging again, go to file just like this, don't click disable. It's not going to do a single thing to you know, um, reset the file. You basically reselect the same file again. Okay, so watch this. This is something that you might want to jot it down. You go to select. You specify the same file again, okay, because you intend to overwrite it. And then you click save again. This time, Logisim notice that, hey, you're, you're trying to specify exactly the same file as last time, or the file does exist. So what do you want me to do? Do you want me to overwrite, which means you're know, resetting the content of the file so that it only reflects the current, the next log session? Or do you want me to append to what is already in the file? For this lab, you want to choose overwrite. Okay, because you're gonna do some counting, you know, for a different version, slightly changed version of the program, you know, like up to five times. So every time you do an experiment, you want to overwrite the file so that the way you're counting 
is only for one single run of the program and not counting all the previous runs into the same count. Is that okay? All right. So it does give you a choice. Okay. You just have to remember which one to choose. And overwrite is usually the right answer. I have not personally used append ever in this particular situation. So just you know, click overwrite, close the window, and this time when I run this code, it's going to be different. Now, how do I know it is different, right? Um, I can go here and I can now do some hacking, okay? In other words, I want to change this program so it doesn't count from four, three, two, one, negative one, and then exit the program. This time, I can change a few things. I can change, you know, the starting value of register C, which is what the highlighted byte is about. I can also change the decrement amount, which is over here. So I'm going to change, eh, just for the sake of this particular thing, I'm going to change this 4, and I'll turn it into 1, 0, which is 16. So this time, the log is going to be longer, right? Okay, so we'll give it a try. All right, so double-checking everything, making sure that I reset everything except for the RAM. Clock is low. Click the reset button. I know I clicked it probably already, but it's okay. It doesn't hurt anything to click it again. And for those of you who really want to visualize how things are changed, especially you know, just looking at the output pin, you can lower the clock speed, and then it will actually be somewhat visible to you how things you know, happen. So I, I lowered the clock speed to 256 hertz, which means we have 128 cycles of the clock every second, if it is you know, accurate. So now we do a control K. You should see your register C going from one, zero, zero, zero. No, excuse me, I take it back. It should be one followed by four zeros, and then it will decrement you know, un until we get to all ones. Okay, so let's take a look. Yep, that was pretty quick, right? But since everything is recorded, you can slow mode this entire section of the lecture. Just go frame by frame by frame. Okay. Do the whole thing in slow motion. Okay, so Control K again, and then this time I can now go back to the log file. Okay, so uh, LibreOffice, I can go to LibreOffice and just change that, or I can just Control C, get out of this, and do it all over again. Nope, do not recover. Yes, I'm sure. And then click OK. And this time you can see how it went from 1, 0 to 0F zero to 0E zero e, and so on and so forth. So are we doing OK so far with all the things that I just talked about? So part of this has to do with the processor itself. Part of it has to do with how to use logic sim. And you are going to have to use some of the tricks that I just talked about for the lab today. All right, so we got about five more minutes before the end of the lecture. I want to see if there are any questions about the content that we just talked about today. Okay, just one thing, okay, I want to remind everybody that the note taking is not only on the concept of, you know, how the processor operates. Sometimes you might need to write some notes about how to use LogiSim because you're going to have to use you know, some of the techniques over and over again. So if you have it written down in your notes, then it's easier for you to find out, oh, how did I, you know, uh, how do I log something, you know, in the file? Since we have five more minutes, I'm going to show you something that is fancy. And, you know, some of you will eventually say, I want to do that too, you know, and I'll show you guys how to do it eventually. So uh, the tool that I'm going to demonstrate is called... Um, Refer spider, okay? Don't ask me why, you know, it's, it's just a misnomer because of the history of that tool. So I will go to that tool. You know, you don't have the tool yet, okay? I have not introduced that tool to all of you yet. So I go here, I think it's in documents, CISP 310, Refer spider, there we go. And I believe the program is called loop. It is still in the temp folder. So um, from my perspective, I write the code, I run a script called submit, and then I say where to find the uh, TTP ASM or the source file, and that's in my temp folder, it is TP, TTP ASM, and this is all I have to do. I don't need to copy, paste, you know, go to the spreadsheet and all that stuff. 
press the enter key. Oh, okay, it's not going to work because I don't have permission here. Okay, fine. I'm going to change my user to the correct user here, and that's going to work. Uh, TCP ASM. Oops, no, nope, loop. Dot TCP ASM. <laughs> well, because you know I. Uh, let's see right here. This has to do with I you know switching between the several accounts here. Uh, Ch mod. O plus RW loop dot TCP ASM. Okay. Now it should do it. Try one more time. Nope, it still doesn't want it because it's in the temp folder. Let me do this. So, all right. So we'll repeat the command, but this time it is loop one. Tcp asm. All right. So it does let me do it this time. Ah, okay. A few other things, you know, that needs to happen here. Okay, one more thing that I need to do. I cannot remember how to do it. Shucks. <laughs> I apologize, you know, it's, okay, let me try one last thing, okay, one last thing. I have to manually go to the folder where the script is located and then try to run it from there. So we'll see whether this works or not. Okay, it works this time. Cool. All right. So by reading the output of the of the script here, it uploads the program to the source task. It assembles, you know, it lets the spreadsheet assemble the whole program. It downloads the file from the RAM file tab, and it runs logic sim without using the GUI, okay? And then it logs the entire output of the running of the program, and then it stash it into a file, and then we upload that file for analysis. Um, <clears throat> in order for this to work properly, you, that's why you, you should not be doing this this time yet. But to do this properly, I need a no op at the very beginning. It has to do with the bug in LogiSim, so I'm going to have to do this again. All right, so now it's all done. I go back to the assembler. So with the assembler, there are more tabs than you know just the usual tabs that I talked about. And there's a tab called analysis. This is the output of the analysis tab based on the program. This column A is basically the program counter. It tells me where, which instruction I execute. And column B tells me what we are reading, which location am I reading from RAM. So uh, column D tells me which register got changed as a result. Column F tells me the line number of the instruction that executed. And then column G is the actual line that it executes. So that way, if I want to track down the execution of this program, I can see that the subtraction instruction on line 5 of the source code and location 05 in the RAM ends up changing register C to a value of 3. In the process, these are the outputs of the flags. All the flags are 0 because four minus one is a three, okay? We did not end up with a borrow. It is not zero. It is not negative. The result is not negative. And there's no overflow. And as a result, the L flag is a zero. So this is something that is a little bit more advanced than what you will need for today's lab. But ultimately, this tool will give you the ability to debug your program because it shows you the entire path of execution and what happens while your program executes. Everything that matters. What happened to the registers? What location is the opcode? How it changed the flags? And if anything changes memory location, it would also have it logged 
in column C. It will tell you exactly which location got changed to what value. That is how we debug, how we debug programs in this class. We don't have the ability to set up breakpoints. Okay, unfortunately, I did not build write that logic into the processor, but it will give you the entire log of the execution of the program, and everything is being done with a single command like this. Okay, now obviously this is uh, really kind of long and tedious, but you know if you install the tool you know called uh, River Spider, it will work in Windows, it will work on Mac OS, and obviously it works in Linux as well. So when we get to the point where we start to write more complicated code, I will teach you guys how to get this installed and how to use it. Okay, so today is really just a little demonstration of such a tool does exist, but for the lab that you need to do today, you don't have to do this, okay? You, you can go for a much simpler approach of what I just demonstrated earlier in class. All right, so that's that. We are out of time. I'm gonna stop the recorder and then upload it and then